Excellencies, distinguished representatives, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Population is a topic that tends to excite people. Many commentators warn us about the continuing population explosion, while at the same time other commentators warn about depopulation or a coming aging tsunami. The media are full of news about birth rates, death rates, migration, and future population trends. And typically, this news has a negative connotation. Demographic trends are seen as looming problems, no matter whether the topic is population growth or decline or aging. This is mostly seen as something dangerous, something that is not given enough attention. Sometimes population is therefore called the elephant in the room, in the sense that it is something that really matters a lot, but people do not dare to explicitly address and openly speak about. But at least here in this audience, this is not the case. The Commission of Population and Development explicitly and openly addresses demographic trends. Yes, it is the very focus of our discussions. And we try to address the topic in a sober, science-based manner. And as we will see, population matters for most, if not all, of the sustainable development goals. But before we look at some of these SDGs in more detail and study their interactions with demographic trends, it's worth to step back and reconsider what is actually meant when talking about demographic trends. Could you put on my slides, please? Okay. Okay. So, um, Sometimes people tend to think that demographic trends only refer to changing population size and age structure. While these two aspects, size and age structure, together with gender, are clearly key dimensions of demography and demographic methodology, they are not the only ones that matter. Age is only one relevant characteristic of people, and it is often not the most relevant one. Others, such as place of residence, health status, and in particular, the level of education and the associated skills and empowerment through education matter greatly for the interactions of population trends with broader social, economic, and environmental factors. This multidimensional view of demography is also fully in line with the classic definition of demography as being the scientific study of changing population size and structures, with structures stated in plural, which implies the analysis of multiple structures and not only a focus on the changing age structure, as is often done in a more narrow and conventional approach. To illustrate this multidimensional approach by age, gender, and level of educational attainment, we simply add color to the well-known age pyramids as the UN Population Division provides them for all countries in the world since 1950. Here you see in the back the age and education pyramid for the world in 1950 and in front for 2020. You see that in 1950, almost half of the adult population of the world had no formal education at all. They had never been to school as shown by dark red color. And there were significantly more women without schooling than men. Compared to this, humanity since then has made a great progress as shown in the pyramid for 2020 on the right hand side. Despite being more than three times as numerous, now a majority of the world's population has at least some junior secondary education, as is shown in light blue. And amongst the younger cohorts, an increasing proportion has already received some post-secondary, some tertiary education, as shown in dark blue. It is also worth noting that whereas in 1950, the youngest age group of children zero to four was by far the biggest one due to high birth rates, now this youngest age group is relatively smaller due to a drop in fertility rates. And this is partly due to the fact 
that mothers of recent babies were already much better educated than previous cohorts of mothers, and that more educated women tend to have fewer children. More specifically, it is well documented that over the course of demographic transition, more educated women want fewer children and find better ways to limit the number of children they have. Uh, this aggregate global progress in education expansion hides significant differences among countries. This slide shows the education pyramid for South Korea, the country that likely experienced the most rapid education expansion in human history. We go back to 1960 and see there in Korea a very pronounced inter-cohort difference. While virtually all women above the age of 40 are marked in red, indicating that they had never been to school. In the age group uh, 15 to 19, the vast majority already had some secondary education, reflecting the very rapid expansion of education that was happening at the time in South Korea. And uh, this happened even though the population was still very young and was rapidly growing due to high birth rates. And you also see that, as in most other countries, the expansion of female education lagged somewhat behind that of male education. So in 1960, Korea was still a very poor country. Its rapid economic growth came years later, when the better educated young cohorts entered the main working ages. The Korean example clearly illustrates that when there is sufficient political will, even poor countries with high fertility and rapidly growing populations can move uh, quickly towards universal primary and secondary education, as is now the aspiration for all countries under SDG 4. This next slide shows you the pyramid for South Korea in 2020. Compared to the pyramid for 1960, it looks like an entirely different country. Now around half of the young men and women have post-secondary education, as marked in dark blue. Only some older women are still depicted in orange or red, because when they were of school age in the 1950s, the school system was not yet well developed. You see here what we in demography we call a strong cohort effect. And the more educated women of today have much lower fertility. In fact, Korea currently has the lowest fertility rate in the world. This is why the pyramid has become so narrow at the base. Now this brings us uh, directly to the importance of education for the environmental aspects of the SDGs and in particular for climate change. Well, the discussion in the field of climate change has recently shifted from an earlier almost exclusive focus on mitigation, which means reducing greenhouse gas emissions, to adaptation, which means coping with the consequences of already unavoidable change of the climate. The chart here shows the circular relationship between human populations and global climate change. On the left, you have the impact of human consumption causing greenhouse gas emissions, uh, which also caused the climate change. But you also have technological change, which to some extent can mitigate these emissions. Green technologies can reduce the emissions. On the right-hand side, uh, you have already unavoidable climate change. Notes that a global warming between 1.5 and 2 degrees centigrade seems now virtually certain, as confirmed by the most recent IPCC report. But how dangerous climate change will be for future human societies, you see the feedback on the right-hand side, will depend on how well we will be able to adapt to the coming changes. And education is a key determinant of our adaptive capacity to already unavoidable climate change. Human capital is widely recognized as a fundamental prerequisite for economic development and for the building and maintenance of good and effective institutions. And much of this has been mentioned before. 
What is less well known is the decisive role that empowerment through education also plays for human health and survival, including for avoiding premature death, both of ourselves and of people we care about. While many economists and other analysts take it as self-evident that increasing income together with medical progress are the key determinants of improved health and increased longevity, a recent series of studies using these newly reconstructed human capital data by age for all countries in the world came to the conclusion that improving education is itself the key driver of these highly desirable trends. Notably, the apparent empirical correlation between income and longevity that many economists point at is likely to be spurious. It is caused by the fact that education both positively influences income as well as health, and therefore the two show a positive correlation. A YASA policy brief summarizing these important findings stated, when it comes to survival, mind matters more than money. It has been shown that education has true causal effects on fertility, mortality, and many other aspects of our behaviors and life, despite of the fact that in much of contemporary social science, Education is primarily seen as a marker of socioeconomic status and social class. Typically, not much attention is given to the questions of how education actually affects our minds, our cognition, and the way we think and perceive the world. But biology and the study of the human brain structures has established clearly that every new learning experience builds new synapses in our brains. And if they are reinforced uh, through repetition, they remain in our brains and every future experience will build on them. I remember well, uh, having listened to Eric Kandel of Columbia University who got the Nobel Prize in Medicine in 2000 for his work on the brain, and he uh, made the following statement to the audience. Let us repeat this point once more. And your brains change. And when you walk out through this door, you are now physically a different person than when you entered. So education changes our body. And there is no doubt that education directly affects our abstract thinking skills and the degree of rationality in our choices, as well as the lengths of our planning horizon for conscious behavior. In other words, education is a factor that greatly contributes to strengthening cognitive capacity. Most people use this enhanced cognitive capacity to improve their lives and avoid premature mortality for themselves and for the people they care about. And we've shown this before that also for adaptive capacity, it matters and the economist has recently summarized of uh, this work and also highlighted uh, the, the dangers that the progress in education has recently seen uh, due to the COVID pandemic. Sometimes analysts also make the mistake that they project the climate conditions for the future, let's say in 2070, and relate them to today's societies with today's uh, public health capabilities. This is a mistake because we know for sure that not only the climate will be changing, but also societies will be different in the future. So if we go back here, we see that we have, it's the society of the future at the point T uh, plus X uh, in the future that will meet the climate of the future. They provide alternative, uh, uh, this, uh, for this reason, the so-called shared socioeconomic pathways or SSPs have been developed by the International Global Climate Change Community. They provide alternative socioeconomic scenarios for the rest of the century. And the human core of these SSPs consists of multidimensional population scenarios by age, gender, and level of education for all countries in the world. Finally, a word on population aging, an issue that concerns an increasing number of countries. Here again, the future looks different 
under a multidimensional perspective as compared to a narrow focus on just the aging, changing age structure. In this chart, you see three different so-called dependency ratios for the European Union up to the year 2060. The green line shows the conventional old age dependency ratio, which is projected to increase by 60% due to rapidly increasing proportions of the population above the age of 65. This is indeed a very strong anticipated increase. But this simple ratio of just considering the age structure does not consider the important question of whether people are actually working at any given age. So for this reason, we have another dependency ratio, the labor force dependency ratio, that's shown in red, relates uh, to persons who are not in the labor force to those who are in the labor force. It is projected to increase by only a bit more than 20% by 2060 because in many European countries, and that's the countries we are studying here, but it's not so different from many other countries around the world, the younger cohorts, particularly of women, participate in the labor force more than older cohorts of women. And because higher education is also associated with higher levels and longer durations of labor force participation, that also will lead to higher labor force participation, particularly of women in the future as associated with more education. Finally, the greater educational attainment of young cohorts will also be associated with higher productivity. And thus the productivity weighted labor force dependency ratio, the blue line, only increases by about 10%. In other words, the coming burden of population aging looks much less dangerous once in addition to the age structure we also factor in the effects of labor force participation and education. All these examples show that the theme of this year's session, population, education, and sustainable development, suggests a comprehensive, multidimensional, demographic approach, and that these population trends lie at the heart of sustainable development. The Quadrennial Global Sustainable Development Report uh, 2019, another one will be forthcoming later this year, for which I had the privilege of serving as co-author, lists what is called human capabilities and human well-being as the first entry point to the study of sustainable development. And as we saw, it is the population human agents empowered through education that will be able to bring the enlightened agency that we urgently need to address the multiple challenges of today and contribute to sustainable human well-being. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>